o'clock New Heights service. We're really glad to see you all. Um, nine o'clockers. I saw somebody get one of these. Excited to be here. Um, would you please stand as we sing? Welcome to New Heights. Before you take your seats, I'd like to invite you to turn and greet one another, share signs of Christ's peace. Jones. I'm one of the pastors here at uh, Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. I'm glad to see each one of you here on this very exciting Sunday, our new 
worship schedule beginning today. And thank you all for uh, pioneering this 9 o'clock worship experience here at New Heights. A couple of announcements. I'd like to invite you to fill out your attendance cards or the connect cards that are uh, uh, attached to your bulletins. They are how we register attendance. They're also a great way for you to let us know of events and activities, opportunities that you might like to be a part of. There are some great opportunities on your Connect cards today. Um, our usher and greeter ministry, the opportunity to ride the trolleys, uh, to save a, a few parking spaces around here and to, to uh, have the convenience of that trolley ride, and also um, our uh, opportunities to volunteer in the children's church ministries that take place during the worship services. Um, I'd like y'all to consider all of those wonderful ministry opportunities and, and just uh, think about whether or not you might enjoy those. Uh, I'm so thankful that we have a new uh, complement of ushers and greeters for both of our New Heights services, and thank you all for serving today, and you'll see more friendly faces, more new people involved in that ministry as well. Um, with that, um, I would like to ask you to bow your heads in prayer with me so that we can welcome God into this place. Gracious and loving God, we do thank you for communing with us in this time, in this morning. We pray, God, that you would help us to set aside all the distractions of the day, all the things that we were afraid were going to make us run late, all the things that we almost couldn't get done. Help us just to relax in your presence in this time to offer ourselves to you. We thank you and praise you for your faithfulness to us, for your presence in this place. We pray that you would touch every heart in this room, that we might all be transformed, that we might all be reshaped and repurposed to serve you more faithfully every day and to love you more deeply, and to know your love in our lives more deeply. In the name of Christ the Lord, we pray. Amen. Hi, everybody. So good to see you. Did y'all ride the trolley this morning? Anyone? Yes. Great. Okay. Well, I'm excited about today. We're starting a new sermon series today. Uh, before I get into that, let me tell you a little bit about what this image is about. Most weeks now, we're going to have uh, this phone number up where you can text in questions that you have during the sermon. And I think today's sermon is going to be one of those will le that may leave you with more questions than answers. So if you think you might want to give me a question, uh, you can text it in. And like I said, we're going to do this each week. So I would encourage you maybe just to save this number on your phone if you think you might want to do that kind of thing. And then during the week... Hopefully on Monday, uh, tomorrow morning, I will do a video response to all the questions that you give. So you can text it in to, and that's a 501 number, 570-6150. And then on my blog site, well, actually we'll put the video on our YouTube page and I'll put a link to it on the blog site. So I always appreciate feedback, any questions you have. Uh, and so I'd encourage you today to text in any questions you have to that, to that number. So 570-6150. Uh, well, we're starting a sermon series called Talk the Walk today. And basically what we're going to be doing over the next seven weeks is looking at some key Christian phrases or words that we as Christians just kind of throw around a lot, we use a lot, we become very familiar with them. And so we're going to take a few weeks to really dig in deep to what do we mean by these terms. Today we're going to start off with talking about the phrase God's Word. So today I want to talk about the Bible and I want to talk about Jesus, which seem like two very appropriate things to talk about in church. I want to talk about how the Bible is God's Word, maybe how it isn't God's Word, and I want to talk about how Jesus Christ is ultimately the Word of God. Now, to set up to today's talk, I have a very short video clip that I want to play for you uh, from a presidential debate from 2008, so I invite you to take a listen at this. I'm Joseph. I'm from Dallas, Texas, and how you answer this question will tell us everything we need to know about you. Do you believe every word of this book? And I mean specifically this book that I'm holding in my hand. Do you believe this book? I think we got his question, Mayor Giuliani. <laughs> <laughs> well, do I, I need I, to help you out, Mayor, on this one. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was it? I said, do I need to help you out on this one here? Do you want me to help you out? I need. 
Wait a second, you're the minister. You're going to help me out on this. <laughs> I'm trying to help you out. Okay. The, the, the reality is, I believe it, but I don't believe it necessarily literally true in every single respect. I think there are parts of the Bible that are interpretive. I think there are parts of the Bible that are allegorical. I think there are parts of the Bible that are uh, meant to be interpreted in a, in a modern context. So, yes, I believe it. I think it's the greatest book ever written. I, I read it frequently. Uh, I read it very frequently when I've gone through the bigger crises in my life, and I find great wisdom in it. And it does define, to a very large extent, my faith. But I don't believe every single thing in the literal sense of Jonah being in the belly of the whale, or, you know, there, there are some things in it that I think were put there as allegorical. Governor Romney. <laughs> I believe the Bible is the Word of God, absolutely. And I, I try... I try to live by it as well as I can, but I, I miss it in a lot of ways. Uh, but it's a guide for, for my life and for uh, hundreds of millions, billions of people around the world. I believe in the Bible. Does that mean you believe every word? Uh, uh, you know, yeah, I believe it's the, the Word of God. The, the Bible is the Word of God. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I might interpret the word differently than you interpret the word, but I'd read the, I read the Bible and I believe the Bible is the Word of God. I don't disagree with the Bible. I try and live by Governor it. Governor Huckabee? Sure, I believe the Bible is exactly what it is. It's the word of revelation to us from God himself. And the fact is that when people ask, do we believe all of it? You either believe it or you don't believe it. But in the greater sense, I think what the question tried to make us feel like was that, well, if you believe the part that says, go and pluck out your eye. Well, none of us believe that we ought to go pluck out our eye. That obviously is allegorical. But the Bible has some messages that nobody really can confuse and really not left up to interpretation. Love your neighbor as yourself. And as much as you've done it to the least of these brethren, you've done it unto me. Until we get those simple, real easy things right, I'm not sure we ought to spend a whole lot of time fighting over the other parts that are a little bit complicated. And as the only person here probably on this stage with a theology degree, there are parts of it I don't fully comprehend and understand, but I'm not supposed to because the Bible is a revelation of an infinite God and no finite person is ever going to fully understand it. If they do, their God is too small. Got a lot more coming up. Wasn't that fun? I showed that to you for two reasons. Uh, one, I think it's fun to watch certain political figures squirm. Uh, that's one reason why I showed it to you. The second reason is it actually sets up nicely the question and some of the main uh, issues we're going to look at today. What does it mean to call the Bible God's Word. Uh, what, what does it mean to literally believe every word uh, is from God? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, I'm going to give you kind of a warning or a caveat for today's sermon. The, the first part of my sermon today is going to be very critical uh, and very deconstructive. I believe the Bible is God's Word and that it contains God's message of salvation to us. But I also think there's a very popular yet misconceived way of construing exactly how the Bible is God's word to us. There's a very popular view that basically has the idea that, that God wrote this text, that it sort of dropped from heaven, and therefore is timelessly true in all that it says. And I think that's a view of the Bible that regardless of how strongly you hold it, it simply can't consistently be lived out. And so today I want to look at examining what do we mean when we call the Bible God's word. And I want to approach it this way. I think the fundamental mistake Christians make when approaching the Bible is approaching it with deductive logic rather than inductive logic. I'm sure that just clears it all up for you right away. When I was uh, in the grad philosophy department at the U of A, I taught introduction to logic. And so we're going to have a little logic lesson this morning. And that's a class that I think every human being should have to take. Uh, I was also, by the way, because we needed the money, I was a logic tutor for Razorback athletes, and uh, that's challenging. Um, you know, trying to explain you know how syllogisms and logical rules of inference work to a linebacker is a tad bit challenging. You know, it's like well, pretend premise one is the running back, premise two is the lead blocker, the conclusion's the end zone, and stuff like that. So, I became very adept at coming up with little simple illustrations for explaining logical concepts. So. Not that I presume you have the IQ of a college linebacker, but let me just offer you this kind of simple illustration for thinking about deductive logic versus inductive logic. Andrea is the cook in our family. She loves to cook, and she's really good at it, and so she makes all of our meals. 
I don't like to cook. I'm really bad at it, and so it works out really nicely. Now, I've noticed that Andrea has one of two ways of putting a meal together. The first way is this. She comes up with an idea for what she wants to cook, and oftentimes she knows how to cook it, but sometimes she goes to a recipe book, sees what all the ingredients need to be, and then she goes to the pantry and the cabinets and the refrigerator to make sure we have all the stuff. And if she doesn't have all the stuff, then she goes to the store to get all the stuff. Worst case scenario, she asks me to go to the store to get some things she's missing. And I spend the next two hours calling her every two minutes, asking her to give me a little more information about where exactly do I find this. Um, she has stopped asking me to go to the grocery store. So my plan was a success in that regard. Um, but that's one way she has about going about cooking. She starts with a general idea, then she works in all the particulars, puts all the ingredients together to make it what she had preconceived in her mind for it to be. That is a deductive approach to cooking. Now, an inductive approach to cooking goes like this. Instead of coming up with an idea and then working in all the particulars and the ingredients, she first goes to the refrigerator or the, the pantry or the cabinet or whatever. She sees what we actually have, and then from that, she puts together some kind of meal based on what we already have. So every once in a while, we'll have something she calls freezer casserole. And freezer casserole is essentially everything left over in the freezer gets cooked together <laughs> in a casserole. And it's very, very delicious, by the way. Um, but that's another approach to cooking. Going to the pantry first, seeing what we actually have, and then putting together a meal based on that. That would be an inductive approach to cooking. And we could put it like this. Deduction goes from a general idea, a big idea, and then works in all the specifics. Induction goes from specific things, and then from that it derives a more general idea. Are we all clear on that? Yes. Great. Okay. So, many people have grown up being taught, I'm one of them, many of us have grown up being taught that basically, and it was never put like this, but this is the common assumption, we were taught to think about the Bible deductively. That is, we start with God, work our way down to the Bible, and then from that, we sort of bring in all the ingredients of the particular different things in the Bible and make them fit a preconceived idea. So the deductive approach often works like this. We start with an idea of God. God is, is all perfect and all knowing and all powerful. And then we think, well, if a perfect God is going to write a book, then that book would be perfect. Okay? So we start off with the idea of a perfect God. This perfect God must produce a perfect Bible. And then when we go to the actual Bible and we read all of the different particular text in the Bible, from the prophets or the gospels or the letters or some other section in the Bible, um, we, we have to filter all that through the idea that this is straight from God. It's perfect and harmonious in everything that it says. Now, I think a more honest approach to the Bible would be an inductive approach. An inductive approach does not make the Bible be what we think it has to be. It doesn't start with preconceived assumptions about what the Bible has to be. Instead, it just goes to the actual text themselves, reads them for what they are, and then builds up a general thesis about what the Bible is and about what God is. So on an inductive approach, we go first to the actual text of the Bible. And then from that, we draw ideas about what the Bible actually is. Now, when you take an inductive approach to the Bible, when you just read the various documents in the Bible, one of the things you quickly discover is that these are thoroughly human documents. The Bible is not one book written by God. The Bible is actually a library, a collection of books written by many different human beings. And these human beings come from a variety of different backgrounds, a variety of perspectives, a variety of historical situations. They're writing for different purposes and to different audiences. There is a tremendous amount of diversity and humanity within the biblical texts themselves. Now, I think that most of us take a deductive approach to the Bible. That is where we have this assumption about what the Bible has to be because we've been taught the Bible is inspired by God. And we think that by inspiration, then from that, you have to conclude that God either wrote it or kind of literally dictated it to all the human beings. Now, the inspiration of the Bible is a very important doctrine. It's one that we hold as a church. It's one I'll hold uh, as a pastor and believer. So let's examine a little bit what the scriptures say about their inspiration. And the primary text for this comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from who you learned it, 
and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now notice what he says the purpose of the scriptures are, the sacred writings, to instruct you for salvation through Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God. And that phrase inspired by God is one word in the Greek, theonoustos. It literally means God breathed. In the Greek language, the word for breath and wind and spirit are all the same word. So it could be God spirited or God breathed. And is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient and equipped for every good work. Now what often happens is we read this passage about how the scriptures are inspired and we quickly get from that that inspiration equals dictation. But what I want to propose to you is that inspiration does not equal dictation. When Paul uses this metaphor, and it is a metaphor of God breathing life into the scriptures. By the way, the only other time that that metaphor is used in the Bible is to describe the creation of humanity. It says God breathed life, God inspired Adam. Okay? So God is somehow breathing his life into these texts. It reads too much into it to conclude, therefore, that God dictated these texts to the authors. I think that reads way too much into what was meant to be just a more flexible, evocative metaphor about how God's Spirit can use these texts to draw us into faith in Jesus Christ. God relates to us on a need-to-know basis, I think. And the scriptures tell us what we need to know, and they tell us that reliably. They point us towards faith in Jesus Christ, uh, and they draw us into a relationship with him. Here's how we, as a United Methodist Church, define our view of biblical authority. And we have a much longer section. I've just given you a couple of highlights. We have a book called The Book of Discipline. Extremely boring book, but it's a book that contains all of our key doctrines and beliefs. And in the section about Scripture, it says this. Our standards affirm the Bible as the source of all that is necessary and sufficient unto salvation. So let me just pause there for a moment. Our view of biblical authority is that what we need to know to be saved is found in the Bible. That what we need to know about God's grace in Jesus Christ is reliably transmitted to us. We as a denomination, though, do not hold that because we believe in the authority of the Bible, therefore everything the Bible speaks about is timelessly true and inerrant and authoritative. As United Methodists, we locate the authority of the Scripture in its capacity to point us towards Jesus Christ. It goes on to say that we draw upon the careful historical, literary, and textual studies of recent years which have enriched our understanding of the Bible. Now, I'm all about that, as you may have uh, noticed. I, I couldn't be more Methodist in my approach to Scripture in this regard. I believe with all my heart that the Scriptures can point us towards Jesus Christ and that we can be saved through knowing Him. And I believe with all my mind that as we approach the Scriptures, and you know, we shouldn't check our brains at the door. We should use the best scholarship available to us, the most latest and recent scholarship, to try to understand what these texts actually say. My view of the inspiration of the Bible doesn't just come from my, my studies of what other theologians have said. My view of the inspiration of the Bible really comes from my experience of the biblical texts themselves. Because God used the Bible to reach out to me in an extremely powerful and transformative way. Um, when I was a, a freshman in college, I grew up in church, but church was always something that was kind of on the fringe for me. I was very nominal in that respect. I would have identified as a Christian, but I never really read the Bible uh, that much or didn't know much about it. And so when I was a freshman in college, I knew nothing about the Bible, really. I couldn't tell you if Moses was in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Uh, by the way, he's in the Old Testament, in case you're wondering. Uh, but at that time in my life, I had no idea. But someone told me that if, if you want to grow closer to God... Why don't you just start reading the New Testament? And so I did that. On a Sunday night in my apartment, I stayed up late in my bed with the light on, reading, starting with Matthew. And I couldn't put it down, and so I read the whole New Testament in one week. And at the end of that week, you know, after staying up late every night, after everything else was done, reading the Scriptures, I just devoured the Scriptures that week. And when that week was over, there was so much I didn't understand. I understand a lot of things better now, and there's still a lot of things I still don't understand. But at the end of that week, one thing that I was sure of, and I wasn't sure of it in a cognitive way, I couldn't prove it, but I just couldn't deny that there is a God of grace behind the text of this scripture. And this God of grace is calling out to me to be a part of spreading his kingdom of love 
in the world. And so my experience reading the scriptures was one of me being literally inspired by them. That is to say, God breathed his good news of great love for me through the scriptures. And so no one can ever convince me the scriptures aren't inspired because I have experienced them in an inspiring way. They have breathed God's new life into me. And that's what the purpose of the scriptures is, to breathe God's good news of great joy of Jesus Christ into us. I don't believe that God wrote the Bible. I don't believe that God dictated the Bible. But I do believe that God was powerfully at work in the lives of those who did write the Bible. Just as I believe that God is powerfully at work in the lives of us today as we read the Bible. It seems to me, though, that sometimes out of respect for the Bible, out of wanting to have a high view of the Bible, we sometimes, though, claim for it more than what it claims for itself. This view of the Bible of somehow as being written by God or dictated by God sometimes can be a harmless belief, but sometimes it can be a very dangerous belief. Because sometimes beliefs about the Bible can actually distort what the Bible actually says. Let me just give you one example of this. Uh, Several years back, this has probably been seven or eight years ago now, I was discussing with a a Christian woman uh, about the view of women in ministry, and especially what Paul had to say about that. And she was of a very conservative background, and and she thought that that women had no place uh, being in pastoral ministry. And that's, of course a view that's been very popular throughout our church tradition. And still today, women are barred from being pastors in many denominations. And so I I got into this discussion with her, and we started looking at the relevant passages. And some of you may remember several months back, we looked at these passages in worship from Paul's letters. There are two passages in Paul's letters where he says seemingly very strongly that women should keep silent in church. And we looked at those passages a few months ago, and I gave you my take on that. So I'm not going to get back into that now. Um, But folks who make that argument, you know, that women shouldn't be pastors, they ignore lots of other things in the New Testament that lean the other way. So, for example, they ignore the fact that there's indisputable evidence that Paul worked alongside of women who were leaders and preachers in churches. They ignore the fact that Paul declared us all equal in Christ. They ignore the fact that when Paul talks about spiritual gifts, they're never gender-based. He never says, no, these gifts are for the men, these gifts are for the women. No, the Spirit is free to give the gifts as the Spirit sees fit. So they ignore lots of other things and filter those out. So we're having this conversation, and I I give what I think is a very good explanation for why those two hard passages are there. I dig deep into the history and the culture and the context and this and that, and I go on for probably 30 minutes, and I give this really, in my mind at least, a really great spill about how these passages really don't prohibit women from being pastors. And at the end of my, my big talk, She shot it all down with just a couple sentences. She said, why do you keep talking about what Paul said? God said it. Now here's the thing. In her mind, she probably thought she had a higher view of the Bible than I did because she thought God wrote that. I would argue I actually have the higher view of the Bible because I'm actually paying attention to what it actually says. The text itself, Paul never claims that God wrote this letter. Paul says, I, Paul, am writing this letter to you in the church at Corinth. And I take that seriously. But you see, because she thought God literally wrote the text, and because God is timeless and outside of history, when she goes to interpret that text, she doesn't take into account historical context. She doesn't take into account all those sort of time-bound, culturally-bound assumptions. And so I would argue that the way we take the scriptures seriously is by approaching them as they actually are, not as we think they have to be. Now, For the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to say a few things that are going to be kind of challenging. You may find yourself disagreeing with me, and that's okay. That's always okay. But hear me out, okay? Uh, Don't close down. Uh, Don't brand me a heretic until you get to the end of the sermon. And then I would prefer you not do that either. But at least let me get to the latter part of what I'm going to say. But now because the Bible is written by actual human beings, this entails a few things. One of the things it entails is that sometimes, not all the time, Not even most of the time, I would argue, but sometimes we find some faulty ancient assumptions in what the scripture writers wrote. For example, think back a few weeks ago, if you were here about uh, when I talked about Genesis and evolution. Y'all remember that when we talked about that? And we talked about how Genesis 1, we really can't read it as a literally true text, but it still has a powerful confession of God as creator that we can hold on to. And I argue that we can believe in evolution and believe that God used evolution uh, in his way of creating the world. 
Um, I got an email the week after from someone who wanted to give me some critical feedback, and I always enjoy that, most of the time at least. But this one was a very interesting way of putting the objection. He said, why are you putting human knowledge over divine revelation? Why can't you just believe the word how it says creation happened? I mean, why, why do you have to question that? Why put human understanding over divine revelation? So let me just reiterate something. One of the things I said in that message is as we walk through Genesis 1, on day 2, it said that God put a dome to separate the waters from above from the waters that are below. And I talked about how it presupposed that the earth was flat and that there was an ocean of water up in the sky and that God had to literally put a dome to keep the water out. That's what Genesis 2 says happened on the second day. I am not some fringe heretical liberal when I claim the earth isn't flat, okay? Would you agree? Can I get an amen? Okay, the earth is not flat. There is not a literal dome up in the sky. There is not an ocean of water up there. Are we all clear on that? That is not just my interpretation, okay? When we approach the Bible, one of the things we have to make room for are little things called indisputable facts, okay? We have to make room for indisputable facts, and we know that's literally not exactly how it happened. Now again, I think Genesis is authoritative for us in that it confesses God as creator, and we can combine that with the best science of our day. But we just have to acknowledge and be honest that yes, when that text was written 3,000 years ago, they didn't have a correct view of the universe. Not only are faulty assumptions built in the Bible about certain scientific matters, uh, and this is the more sticky issue, but it's important to acknowledge, there are sometimes disagreements about assumptions that went into moral judgments. That is to say, in the ancient world, there were certain assumptions about the way things are that sometimes affected their judgment of what is right and what is wrong. Now, this is where we get on, on, stickier, on, on stickier ground because many Christians are fine with saying, well, yeah, the Bible can err in matters of science or history. But when it comes to morality, especially the New Testament, you know, the Bible is never wrong. And I think it's important we be acknowledged that perhaps it is sometimes. Let me give you a couple of examples. Oh, by the way, uh, this is a picture of the guy that sent me the email about the, uh, the Genesis text. Um, but no. By the way, he was a guest, and I knew him from somewhere else. He did, he's not here today, so it's not offending anyone. But anyways, okay. But here's an example. The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11. Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's degrading to him? But if a woman has long hair, it's to her glory. According to the Apostle Paul, it is unnatural and degrading for a man to have long hair. I'm looking around the room, it's kind of dark. I can't quite see if we have any long-haired men here today. And how do you define long, I wonder? But anyways, how many of you would agree with this, that it's unnatural and degrading and moral for a man to have long hair? Yeah. What Paul says here is built into certain, you know, ancient assumption about how things are supposed to be. Here's an ethical statement in the New Testament, and every one of us here disagree with it. Now, of course, I mean, this isn't really a huge deal, but it's still an ethical statement in the New Testament, and we disagree with it. Let me just give you one more example. I could give you numerous. But in 1 Timothy 2, Paul says this, I desire then that in every place that men should pray, lifting up holy hands. Let me pause there for a moment. When Aubrietta prayed this morning, men, how many of you lifted your hands? Anybody? Sinners. <laughs> Lifting up holy hands without anger or argument, also that women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided. Mm -hmm. Any hair braided here? With gold, pearls, or expensive clothes. Anybody wearing expensive clothes today? but with good works as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. Now, by the way, I, don't, I, I, I didn't have time to look it up. I don't know what he has a problem with hair braided for. I'm not sure where that comes from. Um, but he gives very explicit you know, instructions here about what to wear to church. Now, by the way, just as a side note, this is the only passage in the Bible that even comes close to mentioning what you should wear to church. And it basically says, don't dress up. So I rest my case for the superiority of casual worship. Uh, the Bible is very clear about, about that. Don't worry about dressing up too much. So again, now, I mean, here's a very clear ethical demand, and it's one that, you know, we, just, we wouldn't think about that much, or we may disagree with things of that nature. 
Because the Bible was written by actual human beings, sometimes we find faulty ancient assumptions in what they had to say. Not always, not even most of the time, but sometimes. And we just have to use our best understanding. We have to use conversation with the Holy Spirit. We have to use scholarship just to use the best we can to decide what's applicable today and what's not. Let me give you another example of some of the the humanity of the scriptures. Because the scriptures were written by numerous different people, we sometimes find discrepancies or contradictions. Let me just focus in now on the four gospels and what they have to say about Easter. This would be kind of maybe a helpful homework assignment for you. Maybe get back on YouTube and look at these questions or write them down and look in all of the gospels and answer these questions. Who went to the tomb? What happened when they arrived there? Did an earthquake happen? Did it not? How many angels were there? Was it one? Was it two? Where did Jesus appear? Was it in Jerusalem? Or was it Galilee? Or was it both? What did he tell his followers? You will find different answers to all of these questions. Now, not all of these differences are contradictions. Some of them can be harmonized. Some of them can't. When it comes to certain details around these core narratives, there are some details that are just simply wrong in some cases. They have to be. They can't all be true. Now, what skeptically oriented people will say is they'll look at this and say, well, see there, we can't believe Jesus rose from the dead. I mean, the Gospels contradict themselves on these these basic details. How can we trust what they have to say about bigger things? And I just have to say, I think that's really illogical thinking. There are lots of surface discrepancies, but what's the one thing that all four of these stories have in common? He's not in there, right? There's an empty tomb, and there are people experiencing what they take to be the resurrected Jesus. And that's what's important. That's what we can, that's what we need to know. We don't need to know exactly every correct detail on Easter morning, but we do need to know the tomb is empty, and that's something that's communicated to us very clearly. I think it's very telling that the early churches, they were putting the Bible together They did not think that they had to have just one perfect account of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. They didn't think they needed one perfect account that was supernaturally protected from all error. Instead, they were content to have four very human accounts. They thought this would be adequate to leading us to faith in Christ. The early church didn't seem to be bothered by surface discrepancies. They didn't try to iron out all of the different details They just acknowledge that human testimony, even though it's not perfect, it can be adequate for God's purposes. Now, I thought it would be helpful, and uh, I'm going to have to make this very quick. I had packed a lot into what I wanted to say today. I thought it would be very helpful in this talk if I just gave you a very, very brief thumbnail sketch of how the Bible came together. And I'm going to give you the uh, two to three minute version of it. Um, The Old Testament roughly contains three major sections of documents. There is the law, there is the prophets, and the writings. And those words uh, in italics there are the Hebrew um, names for that. The Old Testament has three major parts, and each of these parts became scripture in an evolving process. The first five books of the Bible roughly were acknowledged as scripture at around 600 B.C. First five books of the Bible. So the very first Bible was five books. Over time writings of the prophets began to be added to what was considered scripture. And that happened somewhere around 400 B.C. Then there was an additional group of writings, things like Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, things like that, that began to be added even later on. And so at around 200 B.C., some more of these writings were considered scripture. So by the time of Jesus, what we consider the Old Testament That was roughly the Jewish Bible. Now, there was a difference in order, and there was some debate about particular books, but roughly what we call the Old Testament was the Bible for Jesus and his first followers. And this is roughly the outline in which it happened. Now, when we turn to the New Testament, things get a a, a tad messier. Um, Some of Paul's letters were considered Scripture by the late first century. Now, let me make an important distinction here. I just realized this could be confusing. These aren't the dates at which these texts were written. These are the dates at which they came to be considered scripture. For instance, Paul wrote his letters between 40 and 60 A.D. The Gospels were written between 60 and 90 uh, A.D. But these were the times in which they started to be considered authoritative and have scriptural status. Towards the end of the first century, some of Paul's letters, not all of them, but some were considered scripture. There's good evidence that towards the beginning of 
the second century, the four Gospels had begun to be considered Scripture. There's also some good evidence to suggest that by the end of the second century, most of the rest of the New Testament as we have it uh, was considered Scripture. Now, the New Testament, the 27 documents we have, was not finalized until 367 A.D. Now, I put finalized in scare quotes there because there's a sense in which the Bible has never been finalized. Um, there is, even to this day, there is no universal agreement among all Christians about what books should be in the Bible and what shouldn't. There is a certain common core in the vast majority of the churches, for instance, except the same 27 books in the New Testament. Not all. For instance, the church in Syria has an additional book called The Wisdom of Solomon in their New Testament. So it's still not completely finalized, but, but, but pretty much finalized. Now here's what I want you to take from this. The Bible began to be put together in 6th century B.C. It wasn't finalized, as much as we could say it was finalized, until the 4th century A.D. That's a thousand year period over which the Bible is being put together. It was written by human beings. It was transmitted by human beings. It was translated by human beings. It was edited by human beings. It was put together by human beings. None of that gets in the way of it being adequate to do what God wants it to do, and that is to lead us to faith in Jesus Christ. I've been critical throughout most of the sermon, so let me end on a constructive note. The Bible, interestingly, never refers to itself as God's Word. It's a phrase we often use to talk about the Bible, but the Bible never calls itself God's Word. You know what it calls God's Word, or who it calls God's Word? is Jesus. In John chapter 1, the writer says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. The Greek word word is logos, which means logic or reason or expression or word. Logos is that which reveals or expresses what's on the inside. You know, a word, when used properly, expresses and reveals what's in here. But sometimes spoken words are insufficient to communicate what's in here. A few years ago, I was sitting with a couple who was trying to put their marriage back together after an infidelity. And the husband was so sorrowful and regretful for what he had done. And when we were visiting together, he just kept saying over and over, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And naturally and understandably enough, the wife didn't really believe him. She just kept saying, those are just words, those are just words. And at one point he looked at her and he said, I wish I could just take my heart out and show it to you. The central claim of the Christian faith is that God took his heart out and showed it to us. And it looks like Jesus. The central claim of the Christian faith is not that God wrote a book. It's not that God revealed himself with pen and paper. It's that God became a person named Jesus, and he took on flesh and blood. Jesus is God's word. Jesus is the image of the invisible God and the exact representation of God's very being. Jesus Christ is the foundation of on which we stand. The Bible is important and indispensably invaluable to us because it points us towards Jesus and Jesus points us towards God. God's word to us as Christians that God has clearly given us is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to pray with me. God, we thank you for not leaving us to the dim light of our own reason, for shining the bright light of revelation in and through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this ancient collection of texts that we call the Bible, that point us towards your Word made flesh, that draw us into your living Word among us today. Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom and that you would give us humility in how we handle the Scriptures. Remind us that you relate to us on a need-to-know basis. Remind us that you have made your loving intentions toward us abundantly clear by coming to us in Jesus Christ, by being willing to suffer and die to show us the depths of your great love. Remind us that what we need to know, that we are valued, blessed, forgiven, embraced, and welcomed home, you have shown us that in Jesus. Help us to hang on tightly to that. 
And at the same time, Lord, help us to accept the areas of ambiguity and the uncertainty in life that comes with being human. Save us from treating a book as an idol, as a substitute for the divine mystery that cannot be fully fathomed by any of us. Lord, we pray that the Bible would be for us like a finger pointing towards the path that leads to you. And just as you inspired your people long ago, we pray that you would inspire us so that we may continue to be a living witness to your spirit that blows where it will and that has the power to breathe new life in all things. In Christ's name we pray. Let all God's children say, Amen. to invite the ushers to come forward to collect this morning's offerings and as they're coming I simply want to share with you that the great opportunities we have to learn and grow as followers of Jesus Christ that are offered by this church are made possible in part by the offerings that we give. Uh, we have some great Lenten studies that have just begun. We have one beginning February 28th and the information is there in your bulletins but uh, I just want to let you know that you make those opportunities possible. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the privilege of getting to be a part of what you do in the world through our giving. We pray, God, that the gifts we give would be used for your glory and that people would come to know and love you through the ministries of this church and through the gifts that we give. In the name of Christ the Lord, amen.
the skies of mercy. I'd like to invite forward some folks that are looking to join the church today. Uh, and uh, we have had our Membership Matters class recently, and those that have completed the class uh, are coming to join in, in the services this morning. And uh, one family that we have here today, the Hatfield family, Jeff and Allison, we're glad to have all four of you here today. Uh, come on up to the middle so everybody can see you. And I simply want to ask you all one question as people who are already professing Christians. Um, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church, do all in your power to strengthen its ministries, and support Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your Christian witness? And if so, please say, I will. Okay. Let's respond to them. Uh, we rejoice to recognize you as members of Christ's Holy Church, and we welcome you to Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. With you, we renew our vows to uphold it with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Thank you all. Would you please stand as we sing our closing song? Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream and every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only aim is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power. Over all my dreams and in my darkest hour, you are. 
I just want to remind you that over in the gym across the driveway, we've got a bunch of donuts and coffee and juice and uh, Fellowship Central is the name of that area set up over there. So I invite you to go over uh, and have some donuts and coffee and fellowship. I invite you to go with this benediction. As you go forth today, may the word of God, the word made flesh, the living word among us, Jesus Christ, may may he be a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. May the peace of God go with you. Amen. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power Over all my dreams and in my darkest hour You are the Lord of all I am So won't you reign in me again Lord, reign in me, reign in your power Over all my dreams and in my darkest hour You are the Lord Oh, oh, I am So what you think?